Okay, let us start, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to pursue the issue of musical form today. It's an important thing to talk about because it allows us to follow a particular piece of music. And we'll be I, using this metaphor of a musical journey and wanting to know where we are in music uh, throughout today today. Form is particularly important in all types of music, popular music as well as classical music. And we have this complex of material coming at us, the sonic material, and we try to make sense of it. And we say that it has a particular form, and we say it could have a particular structure even. So we tend to use metaphors having to do with architecture and things such as this. Uh, what we are really doing here is taking all of this sonic information that's coming into our brain and getting sorted and makes us want to dance around or clap or be sad or happy and make sense of it in terms of a few rather simple patterns. And musicians like to have forms because oftentimes it sort of tells them what they ought to do next. And where, here I'm here, but what, what ought to happen next? Well, if you've got a, a tried and true musical form that other musicians have used over the years, you might be inclined to use it too because you know, you know your listener will be able to follow you. Now the other day I asked uh, early on in the course about the form in popular music. And I threw this out, not really knowing what the answer would be. What's the most common form that one encounters when dealing with pop songs? And for the most part, there was silence across the room. But one student, uh, who I've tracked him down, uh, Frederick Evans, gave a very good answer. A, a really, a, a better answer than I could have given. So clearly, Frederick knew something about this idea of what he, I, I think, referred to as verse and chorus structure. I might call it strophe and refrain, but it's the same thing whether you have it in a lead of Franz Schubert or in a piece that I know nothing about. And Frederick is going to show us, introduce us to a piece that I know nothing about. I sent him an email last night saying, Frederick, you gave a really good answer. Why don't you pick a piece, come up and demonstrate this? So this is Frederick Evans. We're going, or excuse me, yeah, Frederick Evans. He's going to come up here. I'm told we have to give him a microphone. And he is, he is going to uh, introduce us to this particular piece. Now, you probably all know what this piece is. How many of you have heard the piece we were just listening to? Everybody knows it. Who's the one person in the room that, that's never heard this piece before and has no clue what's happening? Moi. Okay? So, Frederick, tell me about this piece, please. All right. This is a piece by NSYNC back when I was in fifth grade. Um, and it's <laughs> bye, bye, bye. And the pattern that it follows is really like the archetype of a lot of popular songs. It's half of the, ver half of the chorus or so when it starts. And then there's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and then what I call the bridge, which is like an emotional climax, and then the last one is a really powerful chorus where they just bring it home and the music goes away. Okay, so it's this idea of, of changing text and coming back to familiar text and familiar music, then changing, going back to the, unf the familiar new text, and then coming back to the familiar in terms of the chorus. Is that a fair shake? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, should we play, what are we going to hear first? Uh, so first you'll hear at, from seconds 24 to 40, this is an example of the verse where they have the beginning of the plot and then you have the chorus at seconds number about 56 and that's where you get the repeating idea which is like what the piece is based on and then last but not least you have the emotional build up where the background and the chord progression changes a little more solemnly and then there's the last chorus that just brings it home. Okay, great. Let's listen to the, yeah. Okay. Yep, so that was the first verse, and that's when they really get you into what they're talking about. <laughs>
What really interests me here is what they're using is a Baroque ostinato lament bass. But that's, that's, we'll get, we'll get onto that in another week or so. So that's, okay, now we'll go to the bridge, Frederick? Yes, then the bridge is where they really sum up all your emotions and they really just want to tell you what they're building towards. I don't want to be a fool in this game for two, so I'm And then we're back to the core. Yeah. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you, Frederick. That's exactly what I wanted. Um, <laughs> okay, how many want Craig to continue teaching this course and how many want Frederick? Let's hear it for Craig. Let's hear it for Frederick. I knew it. Okay. But that's a good way of getting introduced to the idea of musical form. Uh, let's talk about form now in classical music. The forms are a little more uh, difficult in classical music because the music is more complex. And before we launch into a discussion of, of these musical forms, I want to talk about the distinction between genre in music and form in music. So we're going to go over to the board over here and you can see that I've listed the standard classical genres. What do we mean by genre in music? Well, simply musical type. So we've got this type called a symphony, and this type of music called a string quartet and concerto and so on. We could add other types, ballet, opera, things such as that. In the pop realm, we've got genres too. We've got uh, uh, classical New Orleans jazz would be a genre. Blues would be a, a, a genre. Grunge rock would be another sort of genre. It, a genre presupposes a particular performing force. Uh, particular length of pieces and even dress and mode of behavior of the auditors, the listeners. Uh, if we were going to listen to the genre of a symphony, we would dress up one particular way, go to Woolsey Hall and expect to be there from 8 o'clock till 10 o'clock. Uh, if you were going to hear uh, the Rolling Stones play at Toads, where they do play uh, 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 occasionally, uh, obviously one would not come at 8 o'clock, one would come later, one would dress in a particular sort of way and one would behave presumably um, in, a, in a different sort of way. So that's what we mean by genre, kind of ty general type of music. Now today we'll start to talk about form in music and what I need to say here is that each of these genres is made up of, a, of movements and each of the movements is informed by a particular form. So with the symphony we have four movements there, fast, slow, then either a minuet or a scherzo, and a final fast movement. And each of these movements can be in one of a number of different forms. And we'll talk about what they are in just, just a moment. So uh, when we come to the string quartet, same sort of thing. Fast, slow, minuet, scherzo, fast. Any one of those can be in a particular form. Concerto, generally as mentioned before, has just three movements and sonata, a piano sonata, something played on a piano, or a violin sonata with violin and piano accompaniment. They generally have just three movements, fast, slow, fast. Okay, let's talk about our forms now. In classical music, things go by very quickly and it's difficult to kind of get a handle on it and we generally in life don't like to be lost. We like to know where we are, we like to know what is happening and this is what form allows us to do. So that if we're hearing a piece of music and all this stuff is coming at us, we want to make sense of it by knowing approximately where we are. Am I still toward the beginning? Am I in the middle of this thing? Am I getting anywhere near the end of it? How should, I, how should I respond at this particular point? Well, if we have in mind what I've identified here and we will be referring to as our six formal types, and we can think of these as templates that when we're hearing a piece of music, we make an educated decision about which formal type is in play, and then we drop down the model of this formal type or the template of this formal type, and we sort of filter our listening experience through this template or through this model. So here are our six models. Ternary form, sonata allegro form, theme and variations, rondo, fugue, and ostinato. And they developed at various times in the history of music. 
Demon Variations is very old. Sonata Allegro is a lot more recent. Now, of these, the ones that we'll be working with today are ternary form and sonata allegro form. Uh, and sonata allegro is the hardest, the most complex, the most difficult of all of these forms. It's so called because it usually shows up in the first movement of a sonata, concerto, string quartet, symphony. So, and the first movements are fast, so that's why we have allegro out there. And it most is, most is associated with this idea of the sonata. Um, it didn't necessarily originate there. It originated there and in the symphony. Uh, but for historical reasons, we call this sonata because of its association with the sonata and the, fast that it goes, and the fact that it goes fast, sonata allegro form. So that in a symphony, usually your very first movement will be in sonata allegro form. Your slow movement, well, that could be in theme and variations. It could be in rondo. Could be in ternary form. Your minuet and scherzo is almost always in ternary form. And your last fast movement could be in sonata allegro form. It could also be in theme and variations. Uh, could be in rondo. Could be in fugue. Sometimes it's even in ostinato form. So you can see that these forms can show up. Uh, and sort of control, regulate what happens inside of each of these movements. Okay, are there questions about that? Does that seem straightforward enough? We have this big, uh, big picture of genre here, movements within genre, and then forms informing each of the movements. Yes? Can you say that the form is not used for second movement? No. Uh, um, uh, I said it's possible that it is, could be used for the second movement. A ternary form is one of the forms that could be used with the, sec the slow second movement. Uh, we could also have theme and variations. We're going to hear one of those later in our course. Uh, it could also be a sort of slow rondo. Um, so it's just one of, of really three possibilities there. But thanks for that question. Anything else? Okay, if not, let's talk then about ternary form because ternary form has much in common with what we experience in sonata allegro form. Let me take a very straightforward example of ternary form. Uh, it's from Beethoven's For Elise, the, piece, the piano piece that Beethoven wrote for one of his paramours at one time or another. Whoops. I knew this would happen. Here, I'm going to tell you a story about this. My cell phone broke the other day. Go away. My cell phone broke the other day, so I had to buy a new one. I was really happy about this. I hate to, hated to lose my old Mozart uh, theme. But um, I then had to find a new Mozart theme. And nowadays, my selections are um, more limited. So when you go on to these things, and in truth, I actually had my youngest son do this because I'm hopelessly incompetent with this kind of thing. You go on to these things, and now they only have one option, one option for classical music, one option for, but it's called Mozart. So good choice. Mozart has become the icon of classical music, and I think it, it, it's the individual that should be the icon for classical music. All classical music now has been reduced down to just Mozart. Okay. I had no idea what that was about, but uh, who's calling me? All right. Um, so we have this piece in ternary form by Beethoven. And ternary form is, conveys to us simply the idea of presentation, diversion, representation, or statement, digression, restatement, anything like this. Uh, we like to diagram these in terms of alphabetical letters you can think, just A, B, A. Pause here. We started out here. We are in this key. Major or minor? What do you think? Minor. All right. So we were coming to the end of this A section. Here, the A section is very short. But then we 
major or minor? Major, okay. So what happened there? What do we call this? It's a very quick modulation, very quick modulation. We've, we've changed keys. And I'm going to digress here just for a moment to talk about this, which is this concept of relative major and minor. You may have noticed in music, and it's discussed briefly in the textbook, that there are pairs of keys, pairs of keys that have something in common. The members of the pairs have the same key signature. We could take any key signature, three flats or, or two sharps, whatever, but there's going to be one major key with three flats and one minor key with three flats. Uh, and I think we have up on the board here an example of just that. So you can see written in here the three flats. And this is a minor scale with three flats. Now we could also have three flats over here, but we encounter three flats when we have the major scale. This happens to, to work out so that it's pitched on C. If we come up three half steps in the keyboard, we come up to E flat. So the relative major, the major key in this pair, is always three half steps, one, two, three, three half steps up above its paired minor. Here's another one down at the bottom, happens to have one sharp in it. We have the key of G major here with one sharp, but if we come down three half steps, we get its relative minor down here. And the reason I mention this is not because we actually hear this very much. I'm not sure that I hear modulations to relative major because I don't have absolute pitch and I'm not tracking keys when I listen to pieces. My guess is you're not either. So for the average listener, we may not hear the, the actual pitch relationship, but we may hear that we've had a modulation and you can kind of make an educated guess that about 50% of the time, if it's going minor to major, it's coming in this relative arrangement or major down to minor, it's going in this relative arrangement. So this, hap this happens a lot. So here we are in the midsection of our ternary form, A, B, A. Here's the uh, B part. And then back to the minor A. It's just the opening section of this piece. It goes on to do other things, but it is a very um, succinct example of ternary form. And ternary form is a useful way of introducing a larger concept, which is sonata allegro form. So let me flip the board here. And here we go onto this rather complex diagram. As I say, it's the most complex one of all the six forms that we'll be working with. It consists of three essential parts, exposition, development, and recapitulation. So you could think here coming out of ternary form, you've got an A here, you've got a B idea here, and then you've got an A return back here. But this is a lot more complicated. There are things, lots of things going on. And I should say also in terms of fairness in advertising that this is a model. This is also something of an abstraction or an ideal. Not every piece written in sonata allegro form conforms to this diagram in all particulars. You know, composers would want to do that. They'd have to in, uh, assert their independence or originality in one way or another. But it's a useful sort of model. It tells us what the norm is, what we can generally expect. So we've got these three sort of sine qua non here, and then we've got two optional uh, parts of this that we'll talk about as we proceed. So this is the layout then for Sonata Allegro form, exposition, development, recapitulation. So we start out with a first theme in the tonic key, of course. Uh, it might even have subsets to it so that we could have 1A and 1B and 1C up here. I won't put them up there, but it can happen. Then we have a transition in which we have a change of key moving to the dominant key. 
transitions tend to be rather unsettled. It gives you the sense of moving somewhere, going somewhere. That's why it's called a transition. Uh, it could also, musicians like quickly like to call it a bridge. It's sort of leading you somewhere else. Uh, maybe in that way it is similar to the type of bridge that Frederick was talking about earlier. So we have a transition or bridge that takes us to a second theme in now in the dominant key. If, however, our symphony happened to begin in a minor key, then the second theme would come in in the relative major. So if we had uh, C minor, as Beethoven does in his fifth symphony, so there we are there in C minor, but the second theme, is in the relative major of E flat. Both have three flats in it. So if you happen to start in minor, then composers traditionally modulate not to the dominant, but to the relative major, which is up on the third degree of the scale. That's why there's a th big three there. So then the second theme comes in. It's usually contrasting. Lyrical, sweeter, you heard the difference there. Um, more song-like in the Beethoven, not so much of that musical punch in the nose as I like to refer to it, but uh, a, a more uh, relaxed sort of second theme. Then there's oftentimes some filler or what we might call an interstice, and we come to a closing theme. That's abbreviated up here, just CT. Closing theme of the exposition, closes the exposition. Closing themes tend to be rather simple in which they rock back and forth between dominant and tonic so that you can end on the tonic and that gives you a sense of conclusion of the exposition. Now what happens? Well, you see these dots up on the board. Anybody know what these dots mean? I think we actually we talk about this if you read ahead in the textbook. Uh, somebody tell me what the dots mean? Um, Jerry? Okay, repeat. Okay, so that's what dots in music. We have these double bars and dots. That means repeat. So we got to repeat the whole exposition. Didn't like it first time. We get a second pass at it in the repeat. Then we go on to the development, and as the term development suggests, we're going to develop the theme here. But it is uh, oftentimes more than that. It could be something other than just a development and an expansion. It could actually be a contraction. Beethoven likes to strip away things and sort of play with uh, particular subsets of themes or play with parts of motives. Generally speaking, your development is characterized by tonal instability moves around a lot. You can't tell what key you're in. Tonal instability. And it also tends to be, in terms of texture, the most polyphonic of any section in the piece. There's a lot of counterpoint usually to be found in the development section. Then towards the end of the development section, we want to get back here to the return. And we want to get back to our first theme and our tonic key. So, Composers oftentimes will sit on one chord. What they will sit on will happen to be the dominant. So I could put that up here. We could put a five up here because we want a long period of dominant preparation. Bum, bum is where we're going, back over here. But we're going to set this up with preparation in terms of the dominant that wants to push us into the tonic. So there we are back in the tonic now, and all the first themes come back as they did before. We also have a bridge, but this time it does not modulate. It stays in the tonic key. We don't want it to modulate because we've got to finish in the tonic here. So I was thinking just a moment ago, it's kind of the bridge to nowhere. It really is a bridge to nowhere. You stay right back where you are. You stay in that tonic key, then the second theme material comes in, your closing theme uh, comes in. And you could end the composition here. Sometimes Mozart, as we will see in our course, will end a piece right at this point, uh, the end right there. Uh, but more often than not, composers will throw on a coda. What's a coda do? Well, it really uh, says to the listener that, hey, the piece is sort of at an end here. Codas generally are very static harmonically. 
There, there's not a lot of movement. It's, and I, I keep, I, maybe I should have got to come up with a different metaphor here, the idea of throwing a t an anchor over, slowing the whole thing down, simplifying it to say we're at the end. So you get a lot of these bum 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 kind of things in a coda just to, to tell the listener it's time to think about clapping at this point or reaching for your coat. And the other optional coda, what's that come from? Uh, the Latin uh, cauda, I guess, cauda, uh, Italian coda, um, means tail. And these can be, like all tales, long or short. Mozart happened to like short codas. Uh, Beethoven liked longer codas. And the other optional component here is the introduction. My guess is, Jacob, what would you guess? How many? What portion of classical symphonies, you're an orchestral player, what portion of classical symphonies would begin with an introduction, would you say? Most of them? Well, we'll, 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 we'll consider that. Let's, let's go for 50% at the, at the moment. We'll consider 50% uh, uh, at the moment. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. Now, let's jump into a classical composition that begins with a movement in sonata allegro form. We're going to close, we're going to open here with, with Mozart's Eine kleine Nachtmusik, a little night music. This is sort of serenade stuff that he wrote uh, for, um, for Vienna, sort of night music, evening music. Let's listen to a little of it. Um, Linda, just start out here. We're going to start with the first theme idea, and before she does, let me play this. What about that? Conjunct or disjunct melody? Disjunct. Yeah, there's a lot of jumping around here kind of thing. Notice it's mostly uh, uh, just a major triad with underneath. So if we were at a concert and we wanted to remember this, we'd probably have a, a lot of skippy X's here. We don't have time to get into the particulars of this, but that's why we're doing all of this diagramming stuff. So we've got a lot of these skippy X's. Um, all right, so let's listen to the first theme of Mozart's Eine kleine Nachtmusik. Little syncopation there. And a sort of counterpoint to this, so maybe we've got a couple little ideas in here, A, B, and C. Ah, agitation, movement. Here comes the bass. Pause. So we had a cadence there. Dee, 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 dee. That would be the end of the musical phrase, a cadence, and the music actually stopped. I used to like to think of this in terms of a, almost a drama. We've got a, a change of scene here. The, some characters have gone off, the stage is now clear, and other characters are going to come on. So what character is going to come on? Well, a more lyrical second theme. I'm going to play just a bit of it for you. What about this? Is this a conjunct melody? Obviously it's descending. Conjunct or disjunct? Very conjunct. Actually it's just running down the scale. Now we don't have time because this music is going by so fast. We've got our skippy opening theme going around like that. We don't have time to sort of write down all those X's. So maybe just, yeah, da -de -um, ba -ba -ba. And maybe something, da -da -da, something like that. So this is our first skippy theme, our second theme, ya -de -um, has a nice sort of fall to it. Okay, here's the second theme. Repeat. Now, closing theme already. Okay, let's just pause it here for a second. What's the most noticeable, noteworthy aspect of that theme? What do you think? 
thoughts of what would you remember about that? How would you graph that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it starts out. And then it's really conjunct, right? Because nothing, it's just staying on one pitch level, sort of the ultimate conjunct, uh, joined to the point that it's, it's a unison pitch. Da ti 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 ti. So I remember that just like this idea. So our closing theme, da 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 da, turn, and da 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 da, almost the, the woodpecker idea, sorry. But think of that kind of da 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 da, or maybe even machine gun, whatever sort of simp, s uh, silly uh, analogy you want to construct to help you remember that. Okay, so here we are uh, almost at the end of the exposition. Let's listen now to the end of exposition and then we'll stop. Okay, so we're going to stop there. Linda, if, now, on this recording, what do you think? Uh, well, uh, I think reasons for time, let's go ahead and we'll advance it up to the uh, beginning of the development section. So now we should listen to this whole complex once again. We're not going to do that. We're going to uh, proceed here. We're going to go into the development section. And it's kind of fun the way Mozart starts the deve development section here. ask you this. We started here. The development begin, begins higher or lower? Yeah. Lower. So he's dropped down to the dominant. He's now in the dominant. And if he continued as he had, that's what he would have done. That's not what he does, however. sitting here and he ends up there. So we get this sort of dissonant shift and it's a signal. It's like the composer holding up a sign, development, time for the development now, okay? So something we've shifted. We, we are sort of slap in the face telling us that we're at a new point in our form, a new section in our form, the development section. So as we listen to this, we'll hear Mozart move quickly through some lots of different keys. I wouldn't be able to tell you what keys they are. I really wouldn't. Uh, but I do know that he moves through different keys. Uh, then we will hear a retransition start. But here's my challenge to you and why I started putting all these things up here. Which theme does he choose to develop here? Kind of interesting. Does he go with the first theme? Bum, ba, bum, ba, 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 or the ya di or the da di 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 So which one? Okay, stop it right there. Now he's all the way, first of all, what's the answer to the question? Which theme did he use here? We're now at the retransition, almost finished this short development. Which one did he use? Who, who thinks they know? Raise your hand. Uh, Elizabeth? Use just the closing theme. Ba dee 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 ba 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 da. So nothing but the closing theme in this short development section. Now we are at the retransition, and you're going to hear the violins come down. Ya da da dee 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 dee. But if I could sing a harmony, maybe we should all sing it together. We'll be singing da. It's the implied bass line ba, and it's going to go bum back to the tonic, and we go. Bum, then that first theme is going to come back in here. So let's listen to Mozart write a retransition, and I'm going to sing the implied or then sounded dominant that's going to lead to the tonic. Oh. 
all the first theme material coming back, nothing new. Here goes our bridge now movement. And he just cut it short. The first time he went there, bum 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 is what the bass did. This time he just stops the thing and stays in the tonic key. And then the rest of the material will come back in uh, in the proper order in the tonic key. All right, we not, need not hear that. Let's go on now to the coda. And we're just going to listen generally to what happens in a coda here. Typical coda with Mozart. It's almost uh, stereotypical, right? You could have written that. I could, even I could have written that. Not so hard, but it, as I say, it's just a, a load of bricks to bring this thing to a conclusion. But it's a beautiful example of Sonata Allegro form. It does what our model requires in all particulars in a in an unusually uh, rapid uh, rate here, about six minutes for this particular movement. Let's go on to um, a rather another famous example of Sonata Allegro form, and that's the beginning of your own Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Symphony number no. five, we of course worked with this before, uh, and you know the beginning, but let's listen to a bit of this, and we're going to follow it through now uh, all the way to the, into the exposition development in terms of form, uh, not some of the issues we were working with before, but in terms of form. So, no introduction, just starts off with his first motive there, our four note motive. And now the bridge is going to start. Get a sense of moving from point A to point B, or from first theme to second theme. So I'll pause it there. And the horn sort of says, yes, this is the end of the bridge, something like that. You know, this is the end of that. And then a new uh, th lyrical theme will come in. What interest, always interested me here, sort of like the Jaws movie, you know? You never know when it's safe to go back in the water. Uh, you've got this nice melody of da dee da da dee da 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 But underneath you go, ba 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 boom do, 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 sort of lurking under there is this um, pernicious four-note four note motive. All right, so let's listen to the second theme as it starts in the violins, and then we'll build up with Beethoven here. Building up dynamics and pitch. A little bit of interstice here, our closing theme.
let's stop it right there, a couple of points. No, to get, sort of breathe the air of this particular performance, ah, okay? It's because we're going to change to a different recording now. Um, so, Linda, you go ahead and change to that. And while you're changing, let me comment on the closing theme. Notice how in the symphony, Beethoven, once again, is obsessed with this four-note motive. We heard it underneath. <laughs> And at the end, how does he create a closing theme? Well, just coming down an arpeggio, just taking that, uh, that uh, triad. Is this a major triad or minor triad? What is it in relationship to the opening tonality? It's the relative major, okay? So he's going to come up to. Short, 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 long. So everything's sort of short, short, long. All right, so that's how he constructs the closing theme, just a different configuration of that short, 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 long motive. Let's go back now and hear a, a different recording. And tell me what you think about this recording. Uh, how does it differ from the preceding one that we were listening to? At the, uh, it's your le let's start with uh, the uh, second, oh. the, the uh, repeat of the beginning, if you can get there, repeat of the exposition. Perfect. Okay, any thoughts about that? So just on one playing, I know it's hard. I should have sit the two up here and play this one four times and this one four times back and forth. What about this one though? Yeah. Second one sounds faster. Yeah, it's a complete, I mean, it's the same music. You, they have the same score. One conductor thinks this should go, ya ti ti ti, ta ti ti ti. That's how Leonard Bernstein would do it and did do it. Um, another conductor, still living, conducting uh, frequently in New York, also Bernard Haitink. Ya ti ti ti, ti 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 ti. So it, it, it gets through this, about 30, this exposition about 30 seconds faster than Leonard Bernstein did. Just a, a difference in interpretation. So let's listen now quickly, uh, because it does go quickly, to Bernard Hytink's interpretation of the exposition of this first movement. Okay, that's probably enough of that. Let's go on to the development now. Development. Well, how's the development of this symphony start? Which theme is he using? Well, you can imagine. Oops, I've got to get the right pages up here. Oops, here we go. This four note motive. Mozart did in Anna Klein and music, throws in a highly dissonant chord there to announce the beginning of the development section. Then rather quickly, he modulates through different keys. Every time you hear the string sweep, moving to a new key and then modulating to a higher key there. Then he begins to build up, oops, I lost my piece of paper here. Begins to build up in terms of theme. Taking it up higher and higher and higher, and then we get
that sort of sound? Sort of sound. Well, first of all, um, let's talk about this chord. What do you think about that chord? Uh, full attention? Dissonance? Yeah, has a lot. Um, it's called a diminished triad, and we've put this up here. Remember, we've had major triads with a major third in the bottom, minor third on the top, and then we had minor triads. But what would happen if you constructed a triad with just a minor third on the bottom, and then another minor third, two minor thirds? Well, you get this sort of more dissonant sound, more biting sound. So that's what Beethoven is using here, um, uh, this dissonant triad. There's another thing that's quite interesting, and that is that this idea of just pounding away on one particular, particular chord, this sound. That sort of thing. Beethoven started doing this. You ever have your CD player get stuck? Drives you crazy, right? Uh, why is he doing this? And think, think about how the audience of that time would have per perceived this. You know, the, what did the Germans of, of 1808 think? Ludwig, Ludwig, was tun sie hier? This is nicht die Musik, sind sie wackelig? Here is the Musik. And so on. So this is a, this kind of thing. It's almost like the kind of thing they used to use, you know, si old silent movies, and then they tied her up, and then they lit the fuse, and then, and then, then building up tension. If you take this diminished triad and keep placing it at, at successively higher degrees of, scale, of the scale, you get this uh, extreme of tension. And what's he done in terms of, of note values here? Well, we have this, it's almost as if he stripped it down to just one note, sort of reduced it to uh, its most elemental. And I says, well, I could give you metaphors about taking matter and reduce them, them down to some sort of d their densest potential and atomic explosions and things like that. But it's kind of what he's done here. He hasn't expanded in the development section. He's contracted. He's contracted sort of to maximize the rhythmic energy, the almost electrical energy uh, inherent in this particular particular concept. Well, all right, so then he backs off of this, gets sweeter, and then he starts playing around with just two notes. Why two notes? Well, his original theme had just two notes in it. And then he breaks it down to just one note, once again, uh, reaching for the essence here. Now this might not sound like one note, but here's what he's got. That sounds like high, low, high, low, but if you stop and think about it, they're just coming down an octave. So he's really just working with one note here. And then he changes it. And then the theme, please let me in, but the diminished chord won't let it in. It just sort of keeps repeating that one note idea, high, low, high, low, high, low, please let me in, please let me in, please let me in, please let me in. And finally, this sort of insistent motive almost breaks down the door. And then the recapitulation uh, can begin. And so the recapitulation begins at that point. So that's the development section of the, um, uh, of, of the Fifth Symphony here, first movement of the Fifth Symphony, where he puts this electrical moment right in the smack in the middle of the development section, in the middle of the movement. And then we get to the recapitulation. So we've heard uh, some music of Leonard Bernstein's interpretation of this. We've heard Bernard Heitink's interpretation of this. Now let's go on to, as you go out, you can use this as kind of exit music, silly, a bit of silliness here, the Bee Gees' interpretation of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. <laughs>